uh, on time. Uh, so for those of you who have joined the conversation before uh, I said who I was or who have not uh, been into one of these recently, um, I'm John Cromarty and I'm chair of the North of Scotland group uh, of the Scottish Wildlife Trust. So thank you very much indeed for joining us, for zooming in tonight. This is our second event of the season um, for the North of Scotland group. Our first meeting last month went national and was held as a, a national webinar and attracted a very large audience. Um, the topic was what have fungi ever done for us, which was presented by Liz Holden, uh, a leading mycologist. And she certainly gave us a lot to think about in a, in a fascinating presentation. Tonight, we are holding this event as a, a local North of Scotland group meeting. And again, I'm pleased to see that the subject and the speaker has attracted a good audience and a good response tonight. Um, so just a few words of introduction for me, and then I'm going to hand over to Dan, who's going to uh, chair uh, the event and lead the questions and discussion. And then I'll come back at the end again. But just a couple of preliminary words from me, if I may, please. Um, and, and that is just to say that, I guess, whatever your level of involvement in wildlife conservation or the environment, whether as a, an employee of a conservation organisation, uh, whether as a volunteer or a member of one or more conservation organisations, or indeed an interested member of the, the public in wildlife or environmental issues, you're very welcome. And we all share a common interest and we all have our part to play in, in many different ways. Uh, and if you're not involved in volunteering, but you maintain an active interest and you do your own bit, whether by uh, extending your flower season in your garden uh, to provide early food for bees and, and, and other insects and extending it into the autumn, I see we still have red admirals in the garden here, uh, which is nice to see at this time of year. Um, so we all have a bit to play and, and I hope uh, we succeed in, in whatever level of involvement we have. But it strikes me we all need to gear up a little bit and, and perhaps do a, a little bit more and encourage others to become actively interest, interested uh, in what's a very important area. We're increasingly diverted, uh, I think, and distracted from the very important uh, of climate change, of environment, etc., and, and of wildlife conservation by, it seems at present time, by first one national event or disaster or another. And of course, we have many international events at the minute also, uh, which take the focus away sometimes from the important issue of climate change and, and environmental issues. It's important that we don't uh, take our eye off the, the conservation ball, as it were, and therefore maintain interest and maintain pressure uh, from the groups that we're involved with uh, on governments uh, etc to stick to the commitments that we have made not just individually but nationally and collectively internationally and for some reason politically sometimes I think it seems that it's all too easy for such issues to be put onto the back burner and we're told that we're dealing with an emergency of this nature or of that nature of the other and suddenly, you know, whilst we are still fully commitment, committed, the government will tell us to this, that, and the next. At the minute, our focus must be to do X, Y, and Z, which coincidentally doesn't seem to involve the environment or wildlife conservation. So I just, we're all very aware of these issues. And I just mention them because I think now is probably a time, an example uh, of, of when that presents a real problem just at the time when we think we were getting somewhere with international uh, collaboration and cooperation. And I'm not going to say any more because I have no doubt that Fairley uh, will, will, will touch on the subject very much in what she's going to present tonight. So uh, sorry, Fairley, if I'm just uh, touching on your subject. I'm going to stop and I'm going to hand over to Dan Poplett. Dan is our vice chair, uh, himself a naturalist, environment environmentalist and uh, an educator in all environmental issues and we were very lucky to have Dan on our committee acting as, as vice chair and I'm very pleased to hand over to Dan now uh, to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Fairley Kirkpatrick Beard. So over to you Dan and if I could just ask everyone now please 
to stop your video um, and to mute uh, you yourself, if you could, please. I'd be very grateful, except, of course, for Dan and Fairley. Thank you very much. Yeah, there. Great. Thank you, John. And um, I'm really pleased to be introducing Fairley tonight. Grateful for you coming along. Um, yeah, so Fairley Kirkpatrick Baird started with a degree in history, but inspired by concern about climate change, became interested in ecology. Um, after spending some time in the peatlands at RSPB Forsenard, they got a master's in ecology and conservation and went on to model drought risk in Scotland at Nature Scott. Fairley now works in Nature Scott's mapping team and is taking the drought research forward to look at impacts on key Scottish habitats, especially focusing on amphibians. So I'm really in, intrigued um, by the, this evening's title, Drought in Scotland, really, which is, I think, quite um, thought provoking, even the title itself. So I'll hand over to you fairly. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you. So I'll just share my screen just now and hope that it works just as it did in practice. Can you see this slides? Yeah, that's all clear. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so thank you for having me, um, Scottish Wildlife Trust, and thanks to Dan and John. Um, so yeah, I'm Fairley, I work for Nature Scott, uh, and I've been studying drought in Scotland. Um, now, whenever I say that, People always ask me, you're studying drought in Scotland? Really? Um, hence the title of this talk. And it does seem quite surprising um, because we are used to thinking of Scotland as such a wet country. Um, but as we know, climate change is leading to an increase in extreme events. And this includes things like flooding and storms, but also includes drought. Uh, and we've been seeing droughts across Europe, particularly this year. Um, and that even affects temperate countries like Scotland that historically have had fewer issues with drought than some other countries. So Scotland is a good example um, of this. Now, drought is relatively understudied in Scotland, um, primarily because we don't usually see it as an issue, but there's a wide range of substantial potential impacts um, that it can and has previously had here. So that's uh, societal things like impacts on agriculture, uh, sometimes in severe cases, public and private water supplies, um, ecological, things like damage to habitats, reducing food availability for some species, um, and even impacts on climate uh, through erosion to peatlands, which I'll get into a bit more later. Uh, now, there have been previous droughts in Scotland, in Scotland's history. Um, so, for example, the picture on the left shows some freshwater pearl mussels at a, a low tide. A low tide, a, a low flow, sorry, in the river. Um, and we had major droughts. Some of you may remember, some of you in Scotland anyway, may remember um, we had quite a substantial drought in 2018 and even this past year in 2022 that have had impacts on um, things like agroforestry, agriculture, and even the whiskey industry, which nobody wants. So, but despite all of these impacts, which we have seen in the past and we know uh, can occur, much of the focus on research and on mitigation and management is still on flooding and storms. Now, I'm not saying that flooding and storms aren't an issue in Scotland um, and they will be exacerbated by climate change, but there's increasing evidence that drought is likely to become an issue here too. And that will come with all of the impacts that I've just mentioned. So with all of that background in mind, um, Nature Scott was interested in better understanding what drought risk will look like in Scotland in the near future and what impacts that might have. Um, so we set up a project, uh, which I started as a graduate placement and are now continuing to look at how drought risk is likely to change in the next 20 years. So this is really near future kind of timescales here. Uh, what impact this might have on Scottish ecosystems overall, and then, or kind of at, at, a, at a wide kind of overview perspective, um, and then more specifically, what impact this might have on particular species and kind of micro, micro habitats. So to start with the first question, we wanted to understand how drought risk is likely to change over the next 20 years. So in order to understand that, we needed to first calculate drought risk. Now, we did this um, using a relatively straightforward method 
where you essentially just calculate a basic water balance. And I won't go into too much detail on kind of the statistics of this. If anybody's interested, you could <laughs> ask me afterwards. Um, but essentially what we looked at is the relative precipitation. So the amount of water going into a system versus potential evapotranspiration, which is water going out. And that gives you a water, a total water availability for a given place. Um, and as you can imagine, if you've got more water going into a system than out, then that area is likely to be quite wet. Whereas if you've got more water going out than um, coming in, then you may be looking at drought conditions. So we did this calculation for um, uh, on a 12 kilometer grid across all of Scotland for the baseline period, and then compared that to um, using climate uh, climate production data from the Met Office, compared that to the water balance projected for the future period, which is 2021 to 2040. And then we compared them because if you look at the baseline period and kind of describe that as normal conditions, you could see how likely drought is to occur in the future in comparison to that kind of normal baseline period. Um, it's important to note that this is, so this is a relatively Kind of simple way of, of looking at drought. It doesn't uh, account for anything like the type of surface, whether it's soil or rock, how porous that rock might be, anything like that. But because we were looking at a nationwide level, it gives us a general indication of what to expect. Um, so that whole method has a name. It's called the Standardized Precipitation Evapotranspiration Index, uh, which you definitely don't need to remember. But one of the benefits that it has is that it uses that relatively simple method and so relatively easily available data and also it can be mapped. So you can start to look at spatial patterns um, and this is an example of what it looks like visualized. So this is uh, the SPI drought values for 2020 in August um, and basically as you might expect the dark blue areas are wetter and it goes along to the dark red areas which are drier but that enables you to look for kind of hot spot areas. Now, I also just want to mention quickly that there are lots of different types of droughts. So you can have droughts and you can look at droughts over different time scales. So you can look at the drought over a year or several years or just over a month. Um, and we were looking at drought on kind of six month time scales because that's enough time for impacts to start to filter into the water table, but uh, also short enough to see kind of immediate impacts of drops in precipitation. So basically, once we calculated um, that water balance that I just talked you through, you can visualize it like this. And I think this is quite a helpful way of understanding um, or visualizing it. So you've got 1980 on the, the X axis going 1980 all the way up to 2040. Um, and that you might not be able to see that well, but the, the first 20 years, 1981 to 2001 is hatched. That's the baseline period. And basically the red bits are wetter and the blue bits are dry. And you can see that in the baseline period, um, in those initial 20 years, there's approximately an even number of red troughs versus blue peaks. But then as you start to get further and further into the future, you can see there's a lot more red peaks in comparison to, sorry, red troughs in comparison to the blue peaks. And those red troughs are also getting a lot uh, longer. Now, I'm going to caveat this by this is a model that doesn't mean that in kind of 2030 we're going to have like a year-long drought but it gives you a, a sort of general indication of the trends that we can expect and we can use this to then start to quantify our drought periods so essentially if you're using a drought index you can um there's thresholds for what's considered to be drought conditions so normally you would consider any any event under minus a value of minus one there to be in drought and anything under minus two to be extreme drought. So basically all you have to do is draw a line at minus two and look at um, all of the red periods below that, excuse me. And then you can start to go and actually count the number of extreme droughts that you can expect and how long those droughts are likely to be. Um, and I'm saying extreme drought because we were modeling extreme drought and to kind of quantify that for you, um, if you do remember the drought that we experienced in 2018, that was just at the threshold of what we would consider to be extreme drought using this index. So when I'm talking about drought here, I'm talking about kind of 2018 levels or worse. I just checked and the drought that we had this year was not considered to be extreme drought. So this is 
quite quite severe um, kind of drought conditions that we're looking at. So as I mentioned, we looked at this across the whole country uh, and essentially what we found is that drought, extreme drought is likely to increase. Um, this was true across all areas of Scotland. So we basically made a grid across the whole country um, that was 12 kilometers by 12 kilometers each square. Every single square showed some level of increase, even if it was only minor. Uh, and that's both in terms of the number of droughts that are likely to occur, as well as how long those droughts are likely to be. So to show you those results, um, if we look first at event frequency, so the number of droughts we can expect, this map that you can see here on the left is the number of extreme droughts between 1981 to 2001, so our baseline period, that actually happened. So this is observational data. This actually happened in that period. Um, and the average number of extreme droughts during that period across the whole country was one extreme drought every 20 years, approximately. Um, and then if I show you our model, which is the map on the right, uh, the average number of extreme droughts bar in the period 2021 to 2040 projected was one extreme drought every three years. And that increases to every 1.7 years in some of the hot, the darkest areas, which are the hotspot areas. So you can see that's really quite a substantial increase. Uh, and we also saw this pattern when we looked at how long those events are likely to be. Um, and they're projected to be two to three months longer approximately per event. So you've got a situation where you've got droughts happening more frequently, and they're also likely to be longer when they do occur. And again, there's, there's kind of hotspots there that we can look at. So um, if we're thinking about how this might affect Scotland, we'd be interested in the spatial patterns. And you can see it's relatively consistent, as you'd expect, across um, the areas that are going to experience longer droughts and more frequent droughts. So you've got hotspots kind of up in Orkney and Shetland, in Cape Ness, um, in Aberdeenshire, and also down in the borders. Now, we also looked at seasonal patterns of drought, um, and we actually found the greatest increases to be in autumn. And that might seem somewhat surprising, but it's likely due to a buildup of water deficits over spring and summer. So I mentioned earlier that we're looking at drought across kind of a, a six month period. So that means that if you've got quite a dry spring on top of quite a dry summer, by the time you've got all the way kind of six months through all the way into autumn, you could have a, quite a substantial, potentially a substantial drop in the water table, um, which means that even if it's actually raining in autumn, uh, an area could still be considered to be in drought because the water table hasn't yet had time to recover or there's not been enough rain for it to recover. Um, and an, another interesting point to, to note uh, while we're talking about that is you could actually have potentially a situation where you've got flooding in autumn or, or in any season, um, but you've got flooding in an area that's still considered to be in drought and floods can be exacerbated by drought. Um, because if you've got dry soils, particularly in places like peatlands, but in, in other areas as well, then the water can either sit on top or the whole top layer of soil can be completely washed away rather than being absorbed as it might be in a healthy wet soil. Um, so you've got a situation where these extreme events can really exacerbate each other. But if these sorts of insights can give us a sense of um, a, a better understanding of what impacts this might have on the ecosystems and also how we can start to mitigate them because it's important to understand what type, uh, what seasons and uh, periods of time are likely to be most impacted and um, the kind of dynamics across the year as well. So essentially, <laughs> drought risk in Scotland is both more severe than we expected and is happening sooner than expected. Um, which is not necessarily what we expected to find when we set out to model this. Uh, and it's definitely kind of more, more severe results than we were expecting. So now the next question becomes, what impact might this have on our Scottish ecosystems overall? Um, and I, I'm not going to talk about the entirety of Scotland and all of our Scottish ecosystems, because obviously that's very broad, but I'm just going to take two of our key ecosystems um, that are important in terms of their biodiversity um, and also in a, in a particularly Scottish context and, and look at what impacts these, this model um, or the results of this model may have. So 
the, tea, the key Scottish habitats that we looked at are um, rain-fed wetlands and also the Atlantic rainforest. Um, and these habitats are both very important in Scotland and they'll both be impacted, but in quite different ways. So if I start out with uh, rain-fed wetlands, so there's a lot of different types of wetlands and um, rain-fed wetlands, as the name suggests, are primarily, their, their primary water source is from precipitation. So mostly rainfall and also sometimes snow. And that's instead of things like groundwater or springs. Um, and wetlands are hugely important for a wide variety of reasons, where many of you may already know this, um, but well-managed wetlands can act like a sponge and can really reduce the impacts of flooding, as I was talking about before, preventing soil loss. Um, they provide valuable habitats for lots of plants and animals. Um, and importantly, they create, or some of them can create peat, which is a key carbon store. And I'll, I'll move on to that, um, as I mentioned before, shortly. Now, there's wetlands all over the country, um, but the example that I've got in the slide there in the red circle uh, is the location of the flow country, which I'm sure many of us um, based up in, in Inverness and the Highlands are aware of. So this is actually Europe's largest blanket bog. So it's internationally important um, as, as a wetland site and habitat and as a, as a peatland area. Um, and it's located in one of those key hotspot areas. So it's a site of particular concern. And I'll be thinking about that, especially <clears throat> as I look at the impacts on these types of wetlands. So wetlands are rain-fed wetlands are uh, interesting because they are resilient to a point. Um, so in peatlands in particular, uh, sphagnum is a really key species. So sphagnum is a type of moss. You can see uh, a close up there on the right. Um, and it's one of the key plants that makes, makes up a peatland. And because peatlands are so wet, it's, it, I think it can hold up to three times its, its weight in water. I'm not sure if that's the right statistic, but it holds a huge amount of water, but it can cope relatively well with being dried out. Um, and if it becomes dried out and then, for example, in a drought event, and then it gets rewetted again, a lot of the time it can survive, it'll be fine. Um, and because it's such a key plant in the peatland overall, it can really help the rest of the ecosystem recover, recover as well. However, if you've got droughts that are happening more frequently and are also lasting longer, um, the longer duration could have more of a negative impact on the sphagnum during the drought event, so it could be more damaged. And the increased frequency of droughts will mean that there's potentially less recovery time between each drought event. So you've got a more damaged plant that's having less time to recover between being damaged and re-damaged. Um, so while in many ways, uh, peatlands, because they are so wet, they have to be kind of uh, evolved to be somewhat resilient to drought. And in many ways they are, but if, if you get past the kind of point of severity where they can't cope, then you could potentially have quite a degraded habitat um, and overall landscape. And or actually just on that note as well, um, actually, no, I'll leave that for a minute. <laughs> so if you've got a degraded landscape, um, that can threaten the species that live there as well. So just to take a couple of examples, um, great crested newt is not necessarily a wetland specialist, but is often found in our wetlands. Um, this is a European protected species and it relies on shallow pools to breed. So I'm going to come back to this species in particular later on, um, but is vulnerable to shallow pools drying out, as is the azure hawk or damselfly, sorry, dragonfly, um, which is pictured here, which is, um, so dragonflies are quite interesting because they spend the majority of their life as larvae in pools. So several years um, living as little larvae in, again, in relatively shallow pools often. Um, and so if you have a drought event that dries out the pool, that can wipe out several generations of dragonflies all, all at once. And if that happens occasionally and you've got other wet pools nearby, then the population is probably fine. But if you've got many pools in an area drying up quite frequently, um, and particularly over the course of several years, then that could actually start to have an impact on the population as well. And then that has a knock-on effect. Um, so on that can impact the dragonflies and other invertebrates that live in these pools. 
which can then have a knock-on effect on uh, species like lapwings and redshank, whose chicks rely on bog pool invertebrates after hatching. So it really starts to have um, kind of knock-on effects in the, in the wider ecosystem. And then I've mentioned a couple of times um, <coughs> peat, peatlands and the impacts on climate change that drought can have. So uh, possibly an even greater threat from degradation is the release of carbon stores that are held in peat. So peatlands in Britain store more carbon than all of our forests here. Um, and damage due to drought can release some of the bear, uh, can expose bare peat to the air, which then releases the carbon that's stored there. Um, and then this can be exacerbated by other events and made worse um, by drought, like as I was talking about flooding previously, um, which can be, be exacerbated by drought and also fires, which are more likely during drought periods and can release massive amounts of carbon. And we saw um, in 2018, there was some substantial peatland fires up in the flow country, which may have been exacerbated by the drought experience that year as well. So then you can have um, a, a habitat that is usually, or if it's healthy, um, a key carbon sink becoming a carbon source and then contributing to climate change rather than um, helping us to prevent it. So that's rain fed wetlands. Um, now I want to move on to a, a, a habitat that's likely to be affected as well, but quite differently. So this is the Atlantic rainforest. Um, and we don't usually think of rainforest, or maybe some of you are aware of it, but we don't usually think of rainforest in Scotland. Um, but on the West Coast, there's quite a unique stretch of forest that's particularly adapted to the really wet oceanic climate that we found there. Um, and there's nowhere else that has such extensive examples of this particular type of Atlantic rainforest. Now, we know that the coast of Scotland is usually, sorry, the West Coast is usually wetter than the East Coast. That's a pattern um, that already exists, that exists today. And you can see that coming out in the drought model as well. Uh, and the Atlantic rainforest is located kind of in those two red circles and on a long strip along um, that West Coast. And that's one of the areas that's projected to be least impacted by drought. So there will be increases, but they're not likely to be as severe. However, that doesn't mean that this habitat won't be affected. Uh, and that's because it's pretty, it's pretty sensitive to changes in water availability. So because that coast is, um, is so wet and then the Atlantic rainforest is really particularly adapted to these wet conditions, it has a pretty low resilience to drought events. Um, and this is particularly true for the bryophytes that live there. So that's uh, mosses and liverworts. Um, and several of these are really specialist species. And one of the key concerns that we have is that if the, <clears throat> if you start experiencing more drought events in the rainforest, you've got these kind of really specialist wet adapted species. And then you've got other bryophytes that are happy living in wet areas, um, but might be more hardy and more dry adapted. Um, and those species, which are found in other parts of the country as well, might gradually start to outcompete these more specialist species and could potentially in the future end up transforming the rainforest communities um, as, as, the, as they're experiencing drought more frequently. So these impacts will be different depending on the different microhabitats within, within the rainforest itself. Um, so you've got some mosses that can live on rocky crags and on the sides of trees and they might be impacted more early on in a drought event. Um, so if you've got a drought period kind of lasting over a couple of months where you've got initial drops in precipitation and then, then feed into the um, water table and stream flow. Species living on things like rocky outcrops and uh, trees might be more impacted initially by the lack of precipitation because that's their main source of water, but then they might recover relatively quickly once that precipitation returns. Whereas species that live um, kind of alongside streams, particularly in, in streamside ravines, might be more impacted later on once the stream flows start to drop um, and the water table level drops, but then might have a longer time to recover because it takes time for the um, precipitation to feed back into the stream flow. So the way that you manage these habitats is quite different even, even on a microhabitat level. And just to illustrate this, these impacts, we're already seeing them. Um, so <clears throat> this graph is from a paper 
um, published by some colleagues in Nature for Scott from 2019. And you, the graph basically shows um, a decrease in wet loving bryophytes over a period of time, um, kind of going from, what is that, 1960 kind of to the present day. Um, and this was very surprising to the authors because overall Scotland is, um, according to the Met Office, Scotland's average rainfall is increasing. And so if the rainfall is increasing, why are the wet loving bryophytes decreasing? And originally they weren't sure what the answer to this was, but now we've done this drought model. Um, what we suspect is that even if average rainfall kind of over a year is increasing, that rain is um, kind of concentrated in particular heavy patches. Um, so it's raining more in the year as a whole. But if you've got increasing periods, particularly of kind of summer dryness, then that can have a negative impact on the bryophytes, even if the overall impacts, it, sorry, even if the overall rainfall is, is higher. So we're already seeing these impacts kind of affecting um, these, these species in these ecosystems. So to sum up this, um, <coughs> this section, you've got two, two key habitats and you've got rain-fed wetlands, which have low sensitivity in that they're uh, somewhat resilient, but they're in high risk areas. And then you've also got the Atlantic rainforest, which is in a lower risk area, but because it's more highly sensitive, is likely to still experience um, effects of drought. So basically both of these habitats are likely to be impacted negatively, but in quite different ways. Um, and I think I, I wanted to use these contrasting examples to, <coughs> To highlight how important it is to look at um, look at these impacts really on a on a habitat by habitat basis and sometimes even on a site by site basis because we know that drought is likely to increase, but the the way that that will affect um, our natural our natural habitats will be very different depending on the, the the hydrology of the site and the species and all those sorts of things. So it's it's quite complex to work out um, the impacts of some of these, but and they might not necessarily be as you'd expect. Um, for example, the, the rainforest in the, in the lower risk area. So I've talked kind of quite broadly about the impacts that drought might have um, so far. And, and now I want to move on to more specifically what impacts this might have on particular species um, and kind of get more specific. So I'm going to focus for the, the kind of final part of the talk um, on newts and then also what we can do to try and mitigate for and manage these impacts. So focusing on two different newt species, um, the first is the great crested newt. Um, so that's Triturus cristatus. So I mentioned this newt before. Um, this is European protected species. Uh, and we've got a really important population up here in the highlands. So this population is physically isolated from great crested newts um, in the rest of the UK. And because of that, it's also genetically isolated. Uh, and genetic variation is, is very important for conservation. So this population that we've got is of particular concern. Um, and then we've also got the palmate newt, um, this Triton helveticus. Now this is our most common newt um, and is a key part of the ecosystem, both as predator and as prey. Um, because it's very common, it's not necessarily studied as frequently, but if, if, it, if something were to start to impact it, it would be a, a substantial loss to, um, to the ecosystem. So it's important to understand what impacts it might feel as well. Now, to understand how these newts are likely to be impacted by drought, um, we started, so this is kind of the beginning of a wider and longer study that we want to look at, um, which is uh, looking at pond ecosystems the impacts of drought on pond ecosystems more generally, particularly looking at newts. And so we started that by um, doing a field study of initial impacts, which compares data that we have from 2014 
to data we've collected this year in 2022. And um, conveniently for us, <laughs> maybe not so not so well, um, not so positive for the habitats themselves. 2022 was a drought year. So it's quite a good year to be looking at these sorts of impacts. Um, and essentially we have a data set of ponds from 2014. Um, so these are scattered kind of in and around Inverness in that um, red circle there. So it's not, it's not quite a hotspot area, but you can see that there's quite substantial increases in some of the areas around Inverness. Uh, and we took a random sample of 40 ponds from this original bigger sample that we had from 2014. Um, and basically went and re remeasured, excuse me, some of the metrics that we looked at um, this year, so that we could kind kind of try and see change over time. Um, so the metrics that we took were the depth of the pond, um, the water level in comparison to normal. So is it um, High, 10 centimetres higher than normal, um, 20 centimetres lower. The estimated desiccation rate, which is the key um, variable, which I'll explain in slightly more detail, uh, and any amphibian eggs or larvae that were found in the pond. Um, now, we were particularly looking for palmate newt larvae that had overwintered. So in the life cycle of a newt, usually you have um, the eggs laid in the spring, they hatch into larvae kind of in late spring, early summer, and then they, they mature in one year, and then by the winter they're ready to go out and hibernate um, on land. But, um, this is for newts in general, but particularly for palmate newts in Scotland, because it's relatively cold, um, so young newts, larvae need um, relatively warm temperatures to be able to mature into adults. And because Scotland is relatively cold for a newt, they're not always able to mature in that time. So some palmate newts will overwinter as larvae, um, and then they'll just kind of mature the next year and they just stay in the pond overwinter. And if you find an overwintered larvae in a pond, then that tells you that it hasn't dried out, the pond hasn't dried out this year, but that the pond also hasn't dried out the year previous um, because the, the larvae would have died, the larva would have died um, the previous year. So that was quite useful to help us start to look over multiple years, um, as well as understanding the productivity of the pond in general. And all of the ponds that we looked at were uh, 2,000 square meters, sorry, less than 2,000 square meters. So we're looking at um, relatively small ponds that would be potentially good breeding sites for these newts. Now I mentioned the desiccation rate, so that's basically measured as the number of years in 10 that a pond is expected to dry out. Um, so that goes from zero years in 10, never drying out, um, up through all the way up to 10, 10 out of 10, drying out every single year. And this is just kind of estimated um, by eye and by experience. And you've got that middle group of one drying out one or two years in 10 is rarely, and then everything in between is drying out sometimes. Um, and this follows the methodology of amphibian and reptile conservation. And this is the key variable that we wanted to compare to 2014 to look for changes in um, basically how often are these ponds drying out now versus um, back in 2014. So when we compared, when we took these measurements and then compared it, um, we've got these results here. So you can see that um, You've got 2014 on the left hand side and 2022 on the right hand side um, and the blue group is the number of ponds that never dry out so those ponds are always wet always got water in them and you can see that the number of ponds that never dry out decreased um, from 2014 to 2022 so we've got more ponds that are drying out at least once a year then you've got the group of uh, ponds that dry out rarely to sometimes and there's fewer ponds drying rarely or sometimes in 2022 in comparison to 2024. But the key part is that there's a substantially higher number of ponds drying out every single year now in comparison to 2014. Um, and two of the ponds that we looked at were even gone completely. Um, for the ponds that were gone, that might be due to drought. 
It could also be natural vegetative succession. So um, many, particularly smaller ponds will just gradually um, become more vegetative and kind of gradually stop becoming a pond and become more of a marshy area. And that just happens. Um, but that process can be exacerbated by droughts. So it might be a combination of those two things. We don't know. But the key message is that um, there was a lot more ponds that dry out every single year. And that kind of group in the middle has been squished. Um, and you can see <laughs> some of my colleagues standing and looking very sad next to a dried out pond in that, in that picture. Um, so if we kind of drill down a little bit further into the res these results, um, if you look firstly at the ponds that never dry out, so 15 out of the 40 ponds never dry, most of them were um, relatively big, relatively deep, as you'd expect. Um, and four of them had fish present, which isn't good news for newts because fish is a key, fish are a key predator of um, newt, depending on the size of the fish, um, eggs, larvae, and sometimes even adults. And toads were the most common amphibian found in these ponds. Um, toads don't mind fish because toads are poisonous and so they can coexist with fish quite happily, they don't get eaten, whereas um, newts and frogs will get predated on by fish. Um, and so for the ponds in this group we would describe this as mixed conditions for breeding because some of them, very deep, got lots of fish, um, might not have the sort of vegetation around the sides that would be a refuge from predators like fish and they might not have some of the shallow areas that you need so that you've got very warm water for your eggs and larvae to develop um, but some of them might not have fish and some of them might have lots of vegetation lots of shallow areas um, and so the ones that do and never dry out that's great for breeding but um, even for the ones that do have water and they might not necessarily be um, the best conditions. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got the ponds that always dry out. So we had nine ponds of, of the total that dry out every single year. Unsurprisingly, most of these were very small uh, and seven of the nine that we visited were completely dry. So we went to these ponds um, in kind of late May, early June. So that's sort of toward the end of the breeding season when the larvae should start to be developing. Um, and because these ponds were, or many of them were completely dry, we didn't find any evidence of successful amphibian breeding in 2022. So that's no newts, no frogs, no toads. Um, and that's important because in 2014, almost all of these ponds, I believe, had, had some type of amphibian breeding, and that includes palmate newts and great crested newts. So we know that previously these ponds have been important breeding sites for not necessarily important breeding sites, but our breeding were successful breeding sites. Um, whereas this year, we didn't find any evidence of successful breeding. Now, the key question here is when did the pond dry out? What time of year? Um, because as I mentioned, the larvae develop from, or the newts develop from eggs into larvae and then into adults. And if you've got warmer springs, then the newts may start laying their eggs earlier and the larvae may develop faster and so it could be that the larvae if, if the pond's not drying out till kind of late summer then the larvae might have already developed and they might be happy happy with a dried out pond because they can kind of skip around on land but if you've got um if they're not able to develop fast enough particularly as we know in Scotland palmate newts relatively cold um and you've got a pond drying out in late summer or earlier then that whole um and anything in that pond uh, that hadn't developed or matured would die. So breeding may not be possible in these ponds anymore. And then finally, you've got this group in the middle of ponds that dry kind of rarely to sometimes, and we've got 14 of these. So they're mostly middling in size, middling in depth. Um, and we did find evidence of successful great crested newt and palmate newt breeding here. So that's brilliant. Um, and in many ways, these ponds are the most suitable for breeding, but they could also become trap habitats. And this is what we're concerned about. So a trap habitat is basically um, <clears throat> a habitat that seems quite um, attractive and seems like a really good place um, for a species to go, but then has could end up having a negative impact. So 
essentially some level of, of desiccation of drying out of ponds is quite good for newts um, because it controls predation, but well, it controls predators, so fish and also um, odonata like dragonflies. And you can see in this graph here, so this is um, from a paper that was a study that was actually done on the great crested newts in the highlands, so our population. Um, the, the bottom axis is number of years in 10 that a pond dries out, and then the, the y-axis is the probability of finding great crested newts. And you can see that for about a drying rate of about one or two years, um, you've got relatively good probability of finding great crested newts, but after that threshold, it really drops quite substantially. Um, and so <clears throat> the concern about these ponds that are drying rarely to sometimes is if they're drying occasionally, so one or two years, then that could be quite good um, and just control predators and be quite a good situation. But as soon as it tips over that threshold, then it starts to become detrimental. Um, and many of these ponds in these um, in this category, several of them already dry out three years in 10, and many of them dry out two years in 10. So it's not going to take very much. And if we already know that we've got a pattern of increasing um, desiccation, desiccation rates, it's not going to take much for these habitats, which look quite positive now, to become trap habitats um, and no longer be suitable for breeding in, in the near future. And there's a lot that needs to be done to better understand how, how these changes are likely to impact newts and how, what we can best do to, um, to mitigate for them. So, for example, we've started to look at the number of ponds within a kilometre to see, OK, if, if the pond that a newt is in has dried out, can it then just walk to another one? Um, now, the colonisation distance of a great crested newt in the highlands is approximately 600 metres. So if you draw basically a kilometre radius around the pond, that gives you a relatively realistic idea of where they might be able to go. But the problem is they're relatively small and they can't deal with barriers such as roads. Um, so if you look at the site on the left, the pond is the red dot in the middle. Um, and there was 22 ponds within a kilometre of that initial pond. And even if you exclude any ponds above the road, you can see there's still quite a wide area and lots of relatively high number of ponds that that newt, if that pond dried out, could move to. Um, so that's a site on the Black Isle. Whereas on the left, sorry, on the right, you've got um, a pond in Muir of Ord. And even though there's, I think, 16 ponds within a kilometre of that original pond, You've got a lot of different roads, you've got a train track, you've got the entire town of Muir of Ord. And so realistically, a new isn't going to be able to reach many of those habitats. And so some sites might be much more impacted by desiccation uh, and drought than others, just because of um, the surrounding habitat. And that's something that we need to understand better to understand how we can um, best conserve these species against this risk. So to summarise this kind of final part, um, out of ooh, if my slide wants to change, there we go. Out of a random sample of forty ponds, so in twenty twenty two, you've got fifteen that never dry out, nine that dry out always, two that are completely gone, and then fourteen that dry rarely to sometimes. But if you get rid of the four that had fish in, the nine that dry out always, and the two that are gone. And also the four that dry sometimes because they have a desiccation rate of three years in 10. And if you assume that all of those ponds are no longer suitable for breeding or are unlikely to be suitable for breeding in the future, then actually you've only got 21 of your original 40 ponds that might be breeding sites for these newts. Um, <clears throat> and if you imagine that the group, the 10 in the drying rarely category is kind of on the threshold of moving to drying sometimes, then you could end up with even fewer uh, potential sites. Of course, some that never dry out might then move into the rarely category, but some that never dry out aren't necessarily going to do that. It's particularly places like quarries um, that are just so big and deep that, that it's very unlikely they're gonna be drying out. So basically you've got a sub potential quite substantial drop in suitable sites. So essentially what this tells us is um, that we think there is an immediate risk of drought to newts. Um, the combination of the drought model and the field observations kind of gives relatively good evidence of this. 
Um, and that is sort of in line with what the model's been suggesting and our um, kind of research around the two other ecosystems that I mentioned earlier, that these, we know these impacts are going to happen and there's a lot we still need to understand about what they'll actually look like on the ground. Um, but studies like this where we're able to actually go out and, and kind of survey and try and understand particular kind of small scale habitats can really help. Um, so that's all relatively <laughs> depressing. Uh, lots of drought, very bad. But on the positive side, um, and I just want to kind of spend the last little bit of time talking about um, what we can do to mitigate for these issues um, and how we, can, how we can kind of prepare. So the first point to make is the current restoration techniques that we already have uh, are really helpful. So in general, the sites that are the most resilient to to drought, to flooding, to disturbance, to any kind of um, negative impact, particularly of climate change, are those that have the greatest overall ecological health. Um, and we already know how to improve the health of many sites. So, um, for example, for the wetlands I was talking about, you can do things like drain blocking to um, stop historic drainage and drying out of those sites. You can remove non-native forestry from peatlands like they're doing um, huge amounts of up in, up in the flow country. Um, for the Atlantic rainforest, you can control canopy cover and particularly herbivores. Um, and all of those things that we're already doing and we already know are useful will also make sites more resilient to drought without even um, kind of thinking about drought specifically. So that's a positive. The other is that there's already um, successful interventions specifically for drought that we know have helped. So thinking about the newts again, um, there's two examples. So one of the sites that we studied um, in this initial study that I just talked to you about was had a desiccation rate of five years in 10, so it's drying out every other year. Um, and that was deepened specifically to reduce desiccation. And when we resurveyed it this year, uh, the desiccation rate fell to one year in 10. And we also found evidence of palmate breeding. So that was something that was done specifically to control drought that has clearly been effective. Um, similarly, there's a whole series of ponds that are intervention ponds. So these would specifically dug um, for newts and, and other kind of um, pond specialists that, we, that weren't included in our study. Um, but these ponds were dug specifically to be deep in the middle and shallow at the edges and in a cluster. So you've got those, those shallow areas to breed in, but if you come into a drought year, the deep bit in the middle means that they hopefully won't dry out completely. And even if one of them dries out, then because they're in a cluster and they're several close together, it's relatively easy for the newts to then move from one pond to the other. Uh, and when we visited these ponds in mid-August of this year, um, <clears throat> many of them, a couple of them had dried out, but many of them hadn't. Um, and we also found evidence this year of palmate newt breeding, red crested newt breeding, and even smooth newts breeding, um, which aren't very common up here, even if they're common in the rest of Britain. Um, so that's evidence that, again, that's working. And also if, if it works in this, this year, which is relatively droughty year, then we're relatively happy that it will hopefully continue to work into the future. Um, so that's all positive, but there is more that we need to do, um, particularly in terms of actually thinking of drought as a risk at all. So to come back to the beginning of my presentation, um, drought is just isn't something that we're used to considering in Scotland. It's still not something that's included in management plans very frequently. Um, there's increasing research on it, but it's still relatively small. And so we really need to be incorporating it into our management plans and um, making changes specifically and interventions specifically to tackle drought in particular, alongside um, kind of other restoration techniques and making sure that even if the techniques themselves are the same, we're doing them with drought in mind and with the hydrology of a site in mind. Um, and the benefit of having the maps that we've now produced and the kind of one of the main goals of it was that we can now produce targeted interventions as well, particularly in some of the hotspot areas. Um, although we need to remember that even the areas that have lower um, potential increases may still be at high risk. 
due to their sensitivity, but we can really start to kind of target our interventions and be quite specific in particular in the way that we're um, putting in mitigation. And then finally, we also need to be paying attention to indicator species, so things like bryophytes that I mentioned earlier, that are already showing um, <coughs> signs of impact by drought and might be able to kind of give us early warning systems of when these impacts are occurring and what types of impacts we could be expecting. So in conclusion, um, <coughs> uh, early action can really make a big difference. So uh, urgent and early action. So we, we know that this is a risk now, and that's really good. Um, it's more severe than expected. It's happening sooner than expected. I mean, this is, in, this is extreme drought in the next 20 years. So that's not a very positive message, but we know that what we're doing already can help. And we just need kind of urgent evidence-based action that we can target um, with drought, particularly in mind, in order to try and mitigate for one of, for a new climate change that, that we're just not used to having to think about in this country. So it's concerning, but I think that there's a lot that we can do, um, a lot more we need to find out. But overall, I want to come out with a positive message that urgent action can make a big difference and already is. So um, I'd like to thank um, a couple of people from Nature Scott uh, and Sipa and Harriet Watt who helped with this project. And also um, there's a couple of people on the call, uh, Kat O'Brien, David O'Brien and Jeanette Hall who um, were co-authors on this work. My drought model that I presented has been published. So if anybody's interested in more details about that, um, they can go and have a look at it. And um, yeah, I'm happy to, to take any questions. I think that was about 50 minutes. That's great. Thank you, Feli. Just stop sharing. There we go. Thanks, Feli. Found that really fascinating, actually. And um, yeah, so if anyone wants to, if anyone does have any questions, feel free to type into the chat, or um, um, you could also unmute yourself and maybe raise your hand first and um, unmute yourself. But yeah, I found that um, really interesting, quite thought provoking. There's quite a bit there that. Um, um, as you said, fairly is of great concern and it's encouraging as well to see that there's actually action being taken and more that can be taken as long as it's done with urgencies. Um, I, I had a, a quick question actually. It's, um, I suppose, I mean, it's becoming more well known that um, beavers play a role in water regulation. And I was just wondering if you could say a bit more about that, kind of what, um, to what extent would they play a role? Would it be I mean, obviously, it's quite. A, it seems like a, a pretty large scale problem, and would they play a kind of a significant role, or would it be kind of quite minor in relation to the, the scale of the problem? That's quite interesting. So um, I'm going to start by saying I'm not a beaver expert, <laughs> um, and I don't know a huge amount about beaver ecology, but I know that um, our colleagues in Nature Scott, who are working on beavers and looking at translocations and reintroductions, have been looking at. Um, overlaying this drought model with their kind of thoughts on beaver relocations to try and see what impacts that might have. Um, and so it's not something I've kind of looked into, but from my understanding of beaver ecology, they do, they can make really quite substantial differences in their environment, um, particularly around flooding controls. And I would suspect that it would go both ways. The interesting thing about flooding mitigation is that often the interventions that can help prevent flooding are the same as those that help prevent drought, which seems kind of counterintuitive, but I would suspect that um, introducing beavers would have a positive impact um, in terms of drought prevention and mitigation, although I can't be more specific than that, I'm afraid, because it's not something that I've looked into. But I know that it's something that we're working on. Great, thanks. Yeah. I imagine it's, it's kind of habitat specific. I mean, there's probably some habitats that you referred to that wouldn't be affected so much by be beavers compared to others, if that makes sense. So imagine area kind of parts of the flow country, it might not be such a significant impact, whereas other kind of river ecosystems, it really would. Yeah, I'd expect so. So riparian areas will un unsurprisingly be much more affected. And I'd guess that it would um, hopefully help to maintain healthy river flows and things like that. Um, so that's probably, yeah, that's a good point. That's probably the areas that will be most impacted, whereas yeah, low country, not that many trees, not that many beavers. <laughs> oh, great. That's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. I can see uh, David um, 
got his hand raised. So David, if you would like to unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks very, great talk. Um, question for you though. This is, it's very concerning to see how it's gonna affect Scotland, but uh, can you tell us a little bit about effects that you've observed elsewhere in Europe and uh, what's, what's happening there, please? Oh, this feels like a bit of a setup question, but yeah, so over the summer, I've also been um, talking to scientists around Europe um, and interestingly, perhaps unsurprisingly, they've all been see, saying sort of similar things about drought um, increases in drought impacts. So we know that this was a particularly droughty year, although not an extreme drought in Scotland. Um, but I went over and did some field work in Germany um, in May, and we were trying to survey ponds for palmate newts. And I think at least half of the ponds that we tried to survey were dried up. Um, and then I went off to a, um, presented this work at a conference in, in Serbia a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and men, um, that was a conference on herpetology, so amphibians and reptiles, and many of the um, presenters there were talking about how their species of interest were being impacted by drought um, across uh, Croatia, Poland, Italy, all sorts of places, um, the Netherlands. So we've actually got a project going now to look into comparing Scotland with all of these different countries and trying to see what we can learn from them in terms of drought mitigation, um, what we can teach them, and also how we can understand kind of those wider European level patterns. So I think that would be quite interesting because obviously we don't think of Scotland, or we don't think of Scotland as a droughty country. We need to be changing that perception. But how can we then learn from countries that might be more used to dealing with this? Um, the, the Pyrenees is another um, uh, area that we're collaborating with. So it'll be interesting to see how we can learn from international partners because um, we're kind of an international leader in con conservation in many ways in Scotland and it will be good to kind of kind of keep those connections and see what we can learn because this isn't something that we're used to having to deal with. Um, so yeah, it'll be good to see where that goes. Great, thanks. And there's a question here typed in from uh, James um, who says, fascinating and thought-provoking talk, thanks. Curious to think of flow country in my part of the world being impacted by drought. On map of predicted strongest drought, um, strongest impact, sorry, the dark squares appear to follow course of Thurzo River. Is there a significance to this? Do rivers perhaps tip balance towards increased risk of drought if the flow is incorrectly managed? Oh, that's interesting. Um, and I hadn't specifically notice that they follow the course of the first river so I'm going to have to go and have a look into that um because that that would be very interesting to think about um I think you mentioned in my introduction that I, I did some work in the flow country a few years ago so it's an area that I'm, I'm particularly kind of personally interested in but um do rivers tip balance towards increased risk of drought as flow would managed incorrectly I would imagine so um so Again, the, the kind of impacts that I've thought about, or the habitats I've thought about most closely are kind of wetland, wetlands and then um, rainforest. So I actually haven't looked as much about river flow, partly because a lot of other people have, um, that's the area that's been the most studied in what has been studied. Um, but in general, I think that any river that's managed, or any habitat that's managed incorrectly, but any river that's managed incorrectly um, would be more vulnerable if it's been straightened, um, particularly if, if it was maybe had more of a natural kind of wetlands um, type, uh, what's the word? Some rivers kind of in increase their flows and then narrow their flows quite naturally. Um, and if they're able to do that naturally, then the ecosystem can just sort of adapt. Um, but if you've got much more straightened river that's not able to do that, um, I would suspect that then you would have more severe impacts of drought because you wouldn't have those um, kind of natural water management systems. Um, and particularly in the, the impacts that we're concerned about most in the flow country, which is like possibly familiar to anybody who is used to the flow country is that it, many areas of it were drained, um, particularly in the seventies and eighties for forestry um, and non-native forestry that really shouldn't be there. <laughs> and so, Many of those areas are already much drier um, and so we're looking to kind of build retake those habitats um, and build resilience back in and so i would guess that it will be a similar sort of thing for a river um, but it's something 
thank you for pointing that out. That's something I'd like to look into more. Great, thank you, Philip. And are there any other questions? Just I think there's one. another one in the chat just above that original question. Oh yes, he sent it, sorry, he sent it directly to me or um, okay. I'm not sure who sent that, but thanks for a great presentation. Did you ask any climatologists to offer ideas towards your drought model? Looking forward in the next say 20 plus years. Um, so I'm guessing you mean in the next 20 plus years, as in kind of, we were looking at the next immediate 20 years, I'm guessing you mean, did it look further in the future and also just what sort of input we got into it? Um, so in terms of developing the model itself, um, that went through a, a process. So I was, um, I worked with primarily kind of drought and climate specialists from SEPA um, and also got some advice from Harriet Watt in doing that. Um, and then once we'd finished with the model, we got that QA'd and I've completely forgotten the name of the person who QA'd it, but it is it, somebody who um, works quite a lot on climate models. So we got feedback in that way in that um, he gave me comments and then we kind of incorporated them, uh, but we didn't end up changing the structure of the model that much. Um, in terms of looking into the far further future. That's not something that we have done yet. I know that there's a PhD student at the moment who's looking at doing something similar, building on this drought model um, to go, she going to 2070 possibly. So kind of medium, well, many climatologists would still consider that to be near future, but in comparison to what we've been looking at kind of medium future, because um, we can assume that these impacts will only going to increase. I should have mentioned as well that these were on the subject of kind of climatology. This model was produced under um, RCP 8.5, so that's a high emission scenario. So this is a kind of worst case scenario, but on the other hand, we're not on a particularly positive track in terms of our climate emissions at the moment. So I don't, um, I don't think it's completely unrealistic. I'm not completely sure if that if that was what you were looking for in that question. So do let me know if you were um, if you were looking for something else. There's there's also European-wide models that look um, further to 2070 to 2100. Um, so there are other models out there, but a lot of them just don't have the right resolution to really look at um, in Scotland. Well, I can see a hand raised. Uh, hello, I'm Gina. Um, we've got a woodland here. It's called Altmaskeer Thel, and we have a burn running through it. We've just been doing our um, long-term management plan, and there was some discussion about whether uh, I've really noticed the drought this summer and how low the burn has been. And we have um, aquatic insects, caddis fly, and we have dipper in the burn. And there was, and I think they bred this year, uh, which is amazing in the middle of Inverness. And um, there was some discussion at our meeting about whether with um, it would help our burn to dam it more and have pools in it. But I, um, it's part of a wider flood scheme um, outside Inverness. So the water to some extent is managed already. And um, we were, it's, it's down in our next five years to, to look at. And I wondered if you might have any thoughts about whether damming a burn would help in any way. That's really interesting. Um, it sounds like a lovely burn. I'm very jealous if you've got dippers breeding at the end of your garden, that's fantastic. <laughs> um, I, would, I would guess that it would. So I'm not, um, specifically a kind of river ecologist um, and I can take this away and try and find out more if you're interested from colleagues who know a bit more about that um, but I, I would imagine that it would be helpful um, particularly as a preemptive measure because if you're already seeing it start to get quite low then you can imagine that it's only going to get lower um, in the future as this increases and Inverness wasn't one of the biggest hotspot areas but was likely to see increases um, so I would imagine that something like that would be useful and I could, yes, but I can, if you want, I could go and um, kind of talk to colleagues and get some, some clarification on that. Um, 
to be sure, but I would think so. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Yes. Great. So, uh, any other questions? I can't see any. So, maybe if anyone can say if I've missed one. I can't see any more. So, um, in that case, so yeah, thanks so much again, fairly for for coming along, and I'll uh, hand over to John just now. Oh, you're muted. John. Sorry. Okay. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you very much, Fairly. Um, I mean. Thank you so much for such a, a clear presentation, very well structured, very well illustrated, fascinating subject. And I just, I mean, most people must have looked at the title and thought, what? As you said earlier, drought in Scotland. It just, we get the sense that probably the majority of the public, maybe, maybe the majority who are not adversely affected, by the drought conditions that uh, that we've experienced, must think you know it doesn't affect Scotland. Um, I love the way that you you've clearly demonstrated and evidenced that drought does affect temperate countries, including Scotland. You you've taken us through and illustrated very well how diverse the impacts of that can be. And whilst we have a focus, perhaps in your presentation about the impact on nature itself, clearly the potential is to have impact, impact on livelihoods, impact on industries, some professions and vocations that are already experiencing the impact of, of, of drought very significantly. Um, and then uh, both in your fielding of the answers, uh, of the questions and the answers that you've given us, you've shown how you've uh, collaborated on the modelling, uh, including expertise from climatologists, etc., to try and paint uh, a picture of what might happen in, in the next 20 years. And it's good to see that there's international collaboration going on uh, on the various impacts and, and, and what might happen. One would like to think that the more international collaboration there is on such an important topic, the more likelihood there is of concerted international action to do something about the cause. Um, but as we know, that's, that's complicated uh, and, and challenging. Um, you've taken us through the impact on, on uh, two important Scottish ecosystems. Uh, and I like the way you summarised the end of that uh, with the lower sensitivity and the higher risk associated with the uh, rain-fed rain, uh, wetlands and then the Atlantic rainforest uh, with its lower risk but higher sensitivity. Um, and you've taken us through uh, your well-researched example of newts and mentioned other species and other amphibians that are affected by this. But one cannot help but think that the impacts, as you've indicated, are going to be, if this pans out, much broader than just affecting uh, some species. And I guess that's the message that is incumbent upon us all uh, to make some noise about. Uh, that this problem is not going to go away if we continue on our present path and therefore any diversions from our present path of doing something politically about it become all the more important. So many thanks for taking us into a subject area that I think very few of us would have uh, been aware of in anything like the detail that you've explained and for presenting it in such a simple and uh, uh, understandable uh, way to, to those of us less familiar with the subject than yourself. So many thanks. And if everyone would like to unmute themselves briefly, we can do collective rounds of applause for our speakers uh, on, on Zoom. So please unmute and let's have a little round of applause. And then I'd like to say a few more comments if I may. So if you please unmute and collective applause now. Ray. Oh, oh. So thank, thank you very much indeed, uh, Fairly. That was that was just excellent. Uh, great great presentation and uh, uh, fielding the questions very well. Also, thank you very much indeed. So just to close off from me, and, and thank you also very much, Dan, for uh, for chairing and 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 taking the quest through the question and answer session. Just to say to all of you that our next two meetings that are coming up, uh, first one is on Wednesday, the second of November.
and that's on catchment management on the River Fintorn. It's going to be presented by Bob Lawton, uh, who's the director of the Fintorn, Lossie and Nain River Trust. And Wednesday the 7th of December, mentioned in one of your slides, fairly, uh, I notice, uh, is the conservation and future of freshwater mussels in Scotland. <laughs> Um, and this is, we've, we've had this presentation previously, but unfortunately at the time we were in midstream of COVID and it just was very poorly attended apart from committee members and staff. So I hope that this presents an opportunity uh, for those of you who were unable to attend to experience Donald Shields' excellent presentation on the plight of freshwater mussels in Scotland. Donald's uh, a member of our committee and he's an ecologist and it's a presentation very worthwhile hearing. So I would encourage you uh, to tune in on Wednesday the 7th of December. And those of you who are regular participants in the North of Scotland group programme will know that we also feature our Christmas quiz in our December meeting. Uh, so there'll be a, a little quiz of usually of about 20 questions, diverse range of subjects to tantalise you and, and test your knowledge. It's a kind of fun quiz. Mm -hmm. uh, we are doing it as a Zoom meeting this year. So I'm sorry, we won't be supplying Christmas pies, but of course you can have your own and your mulled wine or bring your own coffee. Um, but meantime, I'd just like to close off for tonight. Many thanks once again, Fairley and Dan, and thanks uh, importantly to all of you who have participated in this, this evening's meeting. So hope to see you at our future meetings uh, before Christmas. And until then, all the very best. And we'll close down the meeting now. Okay, many thanks. Bye.